The rise of the tank in World War I (1914–1918) forced the development of tank killing systems to follow. Artillery proved a major factor in destroying tanks early on, as did landmines, and even trenches played their role to an extent. Throughout the interwar years, tank development reached all new heights, as the traditional form of a turreted armored track vehicle was accepted from the World War I French Renault FT-17. From this came the classic tanks that dotted the World War II (1939–1945) landscape, particularly in the European theater, and brought tank warfare into the forefront of modern combat. The prominence of tanks forced engineers to develop man-portable, armor-defeating systems in turn. For a time, the Imperial German Army in World War I relied on a heavy, single-shot bolt-action rifle, as through the Mauser Model 1918 T. Jewer, essentially an oversized rifle firing a large caliber cartridge. Its arrival marked the start of the anti-tank rifle as a military weapon category, and some 15,800 of the type were produced. While not as effective against tanks on the whole, such weapons could target key weak points in a given design, engaging driver-gunner positions or critical mechanical components in an attempt to disable the tank at range. A disabled tank on the field was a reduced threat when compared to a mobile one. The boys' anti-tank rifle proved to be of some value for the British Army, particularly against earlier light and medium tank designs of the World War II. Recognizing the increased reliance on armor by the world's armies in the lead-up to World War II 1939-1945, the British Army issued a requirement in 1934 for a portable, light anti-tank weapon, based around the concept of an oversized rifle firing a massive, armor-penetrating bullet. The designer of the heavy rifle was British Captain H.C. Boys, a designer at the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield, and centered around a 13.9mm cartridge. To protect its development from prying enemy eyes, the weapon was known locally under the code name of Project Stanchion, though, eventually, the rifle came to be known by the name of its designer as the Boys Anti-Tank Rifle. Good progress on the design was made, and subsequent tests proved encouraging, with the bullet able to penetrate 25mm of armor plate. The weapon was introduced with British infantry elements in 1937. However, enemy tank designs had improved by the time of all-out war in Africa and Europe, and it became increasingly clear that the boys' rifle was an outgoing breed. The weapon managed to be effective during the early stages of the war, as enemy armor was still of the light and medium-class variety. Against these targets, the boys' rifle proved its effectiveness. The weapon was especially popular with Finnish army troops in Finland in 1940, during the Winter War against the Soviet Union, the rifle capable of knocking out the Soviet T-26 light tanks being encountered. Most British and Commonwealth troops disliked the boys' rifle design, due mainly to the massive recoil inherent in firing such a large cartridge. Additionally, the muzzle blast was exceedingly heavy, and the noise of the firing action easily gave the position of the firer away. The violent recoil forces led to many bruised necks and shoulders, as the rifle was firmly seated against the shoulder when fired. The weapon was also constructed with numerous small screws fit into relatively soft steel that made maintenance difficult in the field. Nevertheless, the weapon continued use throughout British and Commonwealth ranks, with a few examples falling into the hands of German and Japanese troops, only too eager to use the weapon against their previous owners. The Degturev PTRD 1941 was the most available anti-tank anti-material rifle to the Red Army during World War II. The heavy 14.5mm cartridge held the capability to penetrate armor plating of enemy vehicles at ranges within 500 yards. The weapon could prove useful in defeating enemy armor along such facings as tank turrets, driver compartments, engine blocks and track systems to render an enemy vehicle immobilized. The single-shot PTRD-41 became the most numerous of the available Soviet anti-tank rifles during the war and, therefore, something of a Red Army standard. The PTRD-41 was the most basic of rifle designs in many ways conventional and utilitarian to the core. Her appearance was characterized by the long, slim cylindrical form making up most of the rifle's design. The weapon measured in at over 2 meters, with the barrel making up 1.35 meters of the overall length. The barrel recoiled within the stock itself and, during the end of the firing process, opened the breech and ejected the spent shell cartridge after firing. The weapon operated in a single-shot fashion, meaning that the chamber would have to be manually reloaded after a single firing this handled by the manually operated bolt lever set to the right side of the receiver. 
The weapon operated from a semi-automatic breach system and held a penetration range out to 550 yards, able to defeat some 25 mm of armor thickness at that range. A standard operating crew of two was the norm, but the weapon could be managed by one. The PTRD-41 weighed in at just over 38 pound and, for its day, recorded a pretty hefty muzzle velocity of over 3,300 feet per second. The Lot E-39 Lira was a large Finnish anti-tank rifle used in the World War II engagements against the Soviet Union, earning itself the nickname of Elephant Gun. The Lot E-39 Lira was an indigenous Finnish 20mm anti-tank rifle design used during the Winter War of World War II. The system was designed in 1939 and produced in some 1,900 examples by the end of her run, expanding to include the fully automatic minus 39 Lira 44 anti-aircraft variant. For a time, the weapon proved effective in combating Soviet armor head-on, but as armor protection on new Soviet tanks soon increased, the Lot E-39 Lira was relegated to other though still useful battlefield roles as necessary. By the time of the Winter War the Soviet invasion of Finland anti-tank weaponry for the Finns was in desperately short supply, with only a few 20mm and some 13.2mm weapons in circulation. The 13.2mm breed was quickly found to be useless against even the base Soviet armor. Though these 13.2mm systems offered up their high rate of fire, the projectiles did little in the way of penetrating armor. Those 20mm systems that were in use, however, delivered much better results. As such, a priority on 20mm anti-tank weapons was put in motion, and Amio's Lati ultimately produced his memorable minus 39 lira. Muzzle velocity was listed at 2,600 feet per second, and the firing action was semi-automatic. The weapon weighed in at an astonishing 109 pounds, with an overall length of 88 inches, 51.2 inches of this made up by the barrel. The minus 39 lira carried the appropriate nickname of Norsupasi, meaning elephant gun. In practice, the Lati minus 39 lira proved quite effective at the outset. Perhaps Moreso adding to its legacy was the fact that the minus 39 lira was equally adept at engaging just about any type of Soviet target under the Finland sun, be they armored or unarmored. The minus 39 lira was used against bunker emplacements, low-flying enemy aircraft and enemy troops, including other enemy sniper teams. A fully automatic variant the minus 39 lira 44 was introduced in 1944 in limited quantity to serve as a dedicated anti-aircraft weapon system, seeing service even after World War II. At any rate, the long-range hitting power and penetration values were a godsend for the defense of the Finnish frontier. Minus 39 Lira gun teams also took to targeting certain vulnerable parts of tanks if their cartridge was not able to penetrate the armor directly. This proved the case with the arrival of the heavier T-34 and KV-1 tanks to come. Thick armor proved the Soviet modus operandi until the end of the war, and such armor essentially dwindled the minus 39 Lira seconds reach to an extent. Additionally, the large weapon system was cumbersome to deploy and relocate with any sense of efficiency, and were often left to the enemy when positions were overrun. The 2.8cm SPZB-41 anti-tank gun did little to affect German fortunes in the fighting of World War II, fewer than 3,000 units were made. The SPZB-41 ended as one of the most powerful and largest infantry-level anti-tank rifled weapons of the war, but was limited by its internal complexity and low production figures. Sources indicate just 2,797 total units were completed by Mauser Work AG, with peak production seen in 1943, before manufacture ceased due to the availability, or lack thereof, of the tungsten material needed. The complete weapon system weighed over 500 pounds and required a minimum crew of three to operate efficiently and effectively. The team could hope to achieve a rate of fire of up to 30 rounds per minute if the ammunition supply allowed and their cover was good. A small shield offered some point protection against battlefield hazards but did little on the whole. One of the unique design qualities of this gun was its tapered barrel which measured 28 mm at the firing chamber but decreased to 20 mm at the muzzle. This provided a higher velocity to the outgoing projectile and, theoretically, better penetration at range. To improve accuracy, optical sights could be fitted over the iron that was standard and ranged out to 500 meters. 
The ZPS B-41 was issued to regular Army and Airborne forces, and known to be deployed against the Soviets along the East Front, faring rather poorly against the armor of Soviet T-34 tanks in the early going. The massive Solothurn S-18-100 anti-tank rifle was more akin to a portable cannon and saw a short operational service life during World War II. By this time, the Swiss had quietly developed their own in-house solution under the designation of Solothurn S-18-100, a massive rifle system relying on a semi-automatic recoil-operated action while firing the large 20 mm. The weapon measured 1,760 mm long with a 925 mm barrel and weighed some 45 kg without the magazine installed. The Solothurn rifle was born in the early part of the 1930s, as engineers recovered a World War I-era Verhurt 20mm cannon design of 1918. Improvements were made to the action, and the weapon was placed into trials. Once ready, it was adopted in small numbers in 1934 by Switzerland, Italy and Hungary. Despite its bullpup configuration, the weapon was still bulky and cumbersome to handle on the runner on March. It weighed an obscene amount though its battlefield benefits seemingly outweighed its tactical limitations, particularly in the desire to fire such a large cartridge, a design challenge even today. The cartridge itself was nothing more than that used by the S-18-350 aircraft automatic cannon, which serves to provide the reader with an idea on its size and original intended use function. Despite its Swiss origins, the S-18-100 fell to use by the German Army of World War II. Solothurn had been purchased by the German concern of Rheinmetall as an outlet to design, produce and sell war-making goods around the restrictions placed through the Treaty of Versailles that appeared after World War I. In this way, the company could still exist doing what it did best and would end up arming German forces underneath the nose of the watching world however, not all these guns ended up in German hands. It should be noted that, for its time, the Solothurn S18-100 line was a stout performer against armor of the period. It was simply done in by the advancing nature of tank warfare and the rise of shoulder-fired armor-defeating rockets, coupled with its limitations and expensive complicated manufacture.